Uh, I don't know if this question is a little off, but it's a little more philosophical. Um, I'm not a finance person myself, but uh, I know the efficient market hypothesis is one that's the standard in financial, you know, academics. And often I'll have arguments with people like, uh, I don't do too many rich people, but uh, <laughs> this one person, she doesn't believe in the efficient markets hypothesis. That's just in the books. And she says she always makes more money than everybody else. And then uh, I never really met anybody that lost money in the market. You know, they don't seem to tell me. <laughs> but how, from a philosophical standpoint, um, do you believe in the efficient market hypothesis? Uh, do stockbrokers believe in that? But you can't really make more money than the average returns. And how do you, how do, how did you present that to the public? Yeah, and, you, and you, the question is about efficient markets. Let me say a couple of things. That, we tend to, just like the Congress I was talking about, everything gets polarized. Either it is or it isn't. Well, that's just silly. The fact is the market is quite efficient most of the time. I mean, that's a very fair statement. Okay, it's there. Is it perfectly efficient all the time? You've got to be pulling my leg. Uh, you know, market doesn't drop 23% one day as it did back in 87. If it's efficient, does everything really get 23% cheaper overnight? I mean, it's just not, it's inconceivable. Um, so, and then there's macro-efficient and micro-efficient. Uh, one idea of the efficient market is the stocks are always, pretty much always, uh, priced fairly well compared to one another, but they can all get too high priced, okay? That's, it, it's um, it's micro-efficient but not macro-efficient. And there's uh, there's some truth to that, too, but the, the extreme statements aren't there. And uh, yet, you know, we all, you say, well, I know someone who won. Of course you know someone who won. But believe it or not, the ultimate reality, as I tried to explain, or maybe I didn't emphasize it enough, is if the market gives us 9%, 9% is the number we all divide up. So if your pal made 18%, then somebody else made nothing. I mean, there's no way around the internal mechanics of the stock market. It's a trading game. So, you know, people say it's a stock picker's market. Well, you pick a good stock? Well, somebody else sold you the good stock. You were smart and they were dumb. But the world will little note in her long remember which is which. <laughs> so I like, uh, I should throw in just for a little fun. Um, I have never, at least for a long, long time, defended indexing on the basis that the markets were efficient, that EMH worked. EMH is a theory. I've always defended it on a certain proposition, which I call CMH. Not the efficient matter hypothesis, but the cost matters hypothesis. Okay, a little turn of phrase there for you. Because all of us get the market return before cost, and all of us divide up the market return after cost, as I said in my prepared remarks. So uh, I, I hope all your friends really do make money, and I know everybody thinks they do. And, uh, and in Lake Wobegon, all the children are above average. <laughs> what else can I say? <laughs> Thank you. And I think, are there any more questions? No more. Uh, Mr. Bogle, uh, thought experiment. Thinking of all you've said about uh, intelligent investing from a non-speculative standpoint, what do you think in a random thought experiment would be the effects of um, not a top-down approach of trying to affect some of the costs that Wall Street has on investors, but a bottom-up approach of say, a campaign the size of the one we just saw, $4 billion or so, $5 billion or so, on intelligent, on intelligent non-speculative investing, what do you think some of the effects with that would be in the short term or even over the long term? Well, the problem is, as I said right at the beginning of my remarks, uh, the problem is less with investing than it is with investors. Uh, and, uh, you know, we kid ourselves. Uh, we all think we're above average Investors, we all think we're smarter than average. We all think we're better than average drivers. I'm guessing here that we all think we're better than average lovers. I don't know that. Uh, but uh, so we behave that way as if we know more than the market, as if we're smarter. And uh, so to spend a lot of money to change people's behavior is probably not the best thing we can do. I, th I think it goes the other way. It just, I mean, maybe I'm too rational. But if they just understood the mathematics of the market, as I've explained it tonight, and invested forever and didn't peak. Uh, I tell people, you know, start putting your money in a 401k plan, mostly in stocks at the beginning and mostly in bonds at the end or your IRA, and start that when you get out of, when you get out of school and go to work. And uh, 
never do put money away every month, say 10% of your compensation, and do it every month, and never look, never look until you're 75 years old and retire, or maybe 81 years old in my case, but I haven't retired yet. And when you open that envelope and peek, you won't believe. I mean, you'll think a miracle has happened. Uh, you, you, won't, you won't be able to stand it. You'll say, there's something must be wrong here. Uh, but that's the way to do it. Now, I know that's a lot for people not to peek, particularly when we peek all day, every day, if you, if you looked at it as I saw coming in, Jim Cramer, dull, that paragon of long-term investing and sound thinking. Uh, but, uh, but on that note, I think I better stop because I'm going to get in trouble. Thank you all very much for coming out.